Good morning, everybody. Um, well, I'd like to welcome you all um, to this workshop today on research and innovation for international development, a focus on impact. Um, this is part of the Research and Innovation for Global Development, which is a series of three events for researchers and research service staff jointly delivered by Bayes and UUKI. Um, my name is Louise Bracken. Um, I'm the Deputy Vice Provost for Research at Durham University. Um, in my research, I'm a geographer and I look at uh, research on water. Um, so currently I'm part of one of the GCRF um, hubs. I'm part of the Living Deltas hub. Um, I've also got some Newton funding to understand flooding in Indonesia. So this is a subject that's uh, very close to my heart today. Um, I've just got some housekeeping rules um, before we start. So everyone in the audience um, is muted and your videos are off. Um, audience members should use the questions function if you'd like to ask questions during the event. So please state your, your name and your institution so we know who the question's from. And if you'd like that question to go to a specific um, speaker today, then please name them. We are recording the event um, and the recording will be distributed um, after the session today. Um, and we will also distribute slides after today. Um, so the structure of what we're gonna do today is we've got two speakers who will talk at the outset um, and, and talk about um, subjects um, close to their hearts um, and be very informative for us. We've got some question and answer time um, after the, the second speaker. Um, we then move into a panel debate. So I'll ask the panel members to introduce themselves and they'll have five minutes to introduce themselves. And then we'll go into a, a general um, Q&A session for everybody. So I hope that explains what today's about. Um, so our first speaker today is going to be Chris Maskell, and he's Head of Research and Innovation um, at Official Development Assistance Funding at the UK Department for Bayes Energy and Industrial Strategy. Um, so I'd like to invite you now, Chris, um, to come and make your opening remarks, please. Thanks, Louise. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be speaking with you uh, today and to provide a few opening remarks introducing this event. Uh, I want to start by thanking the team at UUKI for organising today's uh, seminar. Uh, this is the first of three events taking place over the next few weeks, focusing on different aspects of research for development. And this is a vitally important topic affecting the livelihoods of millions of people around the world uh, and an increasing strength of the UK's higher education sector. So I'm very grateful for UUKI arranging this discussion. As Louise mentioned, I'm the Head of Research and Innovation ODA Fund at the Department for Business, which means that my team oversee the delivery of the Newton Fund and the Global Challenges Research Fund. I know that many of you listening today will have some direct experience of the funds, whether in, a, in the UK as an investigator or as an international partner. But others I think will be less familiar, perhaps considering applying for funding for the first time. So by way of a very brief introduction, uh, as ODA Fund, our funding comes from the 0.7% of gross national income, which the UK government dedicates to official development assistance. In 2019, this totaled just over £15 billion, the majority of which is delivered by the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, uh, but Bayes delivers just under a billion pounds of that, split between our R&D funds, so Newton and GCRF, which we're discussing today, uh, and our international climate finance work. And through our research and development funds, we aim to leverage the UK's world-leading research and innovation base to play a major role in addressing the most significant and complex global development challenges. Challenges around climate change, environmental resilience, global health, food systems, education, sustainable cities, addressing conflict and enforced displacement, as well as others. As ODA, both of our funds share the same primary objective, to advance development for the poorest people and countries and to reduce poverty by generating and putting into use knowledge and technology to address development challenges. The Newton Fund is our bilateral fund. It's been running since 2014 with just over £700 million of funding and currently supports 16 active bilateral partnerships with BAC listed countries. Investment is matched, so the UK funds our participants and the partner countries fund theirs, and the programmes are co-designed with the partner. And this matched approach ensures that our international partners are directly invested in the development of the partnerships. We jointly design the strategies which direct the focus of research which is funded and ensure that it specifically addresses the development needs of that country. The Global Challenges Research Fund is our larger fund. The total budget since its inception in 2016 uh, is around one and a half billion pounds. 
uh, and GCRF is multi-geographic and is challenge-led. It funds disciplinary and interdisciplinary research according to a set of challenge areas based on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So whilst one is bilateral and matched and the other is thematic and multi-geographic, both funds support interdisciplinary research and multi-stakeholder partnerships across the global North and South, driving research and innovation capabilities and infrastructures in low and middle income countries. At the same time, the funds also have a common secondary objective, and that is to strengthen the UK's research and innovation base to respond to development challenges and to strengthen the UK's soft power influence in the world through the use of science diplomacy. The significant investment in ODA research since 2014 by Bayes and others has positioned UK research and innovation sector as the world leading in global challenges as recognised by the UN and the OECD. For Bayes, we would not be able to meet this ambition were it not for the partner delivery mechanism of our funds. For both GCRF and Newton, Bayes allocate spend to UK delivery partners to UK Research and Innovation, the National Academies, the British Council, the Met Office, and the UK Space Agency, who work with their counterparts in country to design calls for research proposals to which UK researchers apply through a competitive process. The Global Challenges Research Fund also includes an element of funding to the Higher Education Funding Councils, who allocate direct funding to universities for the overall quality of research. UK as a team of building lasting ties between the UK institutions and their LMIC counterparts. So how do we deliver impact? Well, first and foremost, our funds are ultimately measured in terms of our impact on development outcomes in LMICs. We think of impact as the widespread use and adoption of base supported research based solutions that enable LMIC stakeholders to make progress at scale towards addressing complex development challenges. This kind of impact takes a long time to demonstrate, typically 15 years or more, which is a big challenge for development research. But we have some encouraging evidence that the funds are on track to deliver impact as intended. At fund level, our theory of change maps the pathway to impact against which we map outputs and outcomes, be they academic publications and products, case studies, examples of policy influence, and we separately formally evaluate progress towards impact and delivering VFM. And anyone that joined our Newton Prize event last week would have seen some of the uh, outstanding examples of impact case studies from across Africa and the Middle East, which are being accelerated through the prize. In terms of our secondary objectives, uh, initiatives such as UUKI's recent survey of the higher education community on the impact of ODA is helping to inform our formal evaluation of the fund's secondary benefits and helping to make the case for continued funding. Which brings me on to the future of the funds. Uh, and I know there is plenty of interest in this at the moment. I'm sure it will be a topic of conversation today. Uh, obviously, we are still awaiting the outcome of a government-wide spending review, which will determine departments' budgets for the coming year, so I'm limited on what I'm able to say at this stage. But I would highlight that the, the importance of investing in science and maintaining the UK's position as a global science superpower is a key theme outlined in the UK's new national R&D roadmap. Uh, and at the same time, the government has committed to increasing UK investment in research and development to 2.4% of GDP by 2027, uh, as well as increasing public funding of R&D to £22 billion a year by 2024. Uh, and of course, at the same time, the government maintains its commitment to spend 0.7% uh, of UK gross national income on development support. So the backdrop is positive, uh, and we will continue to make the case for ODA-funded research as we await the detail uh, of the SR outcome shortly. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of discussion about the future uh, and the future direction of the funds here today. Uh, we are always interested in hearing about where we can improve, especially from those who are directly uh, interacting with the funds on a daily basis. So I know that the presentations uh, and discussions here today will be invaluable. Uh, to those of you who are considering uh, applications to the funds, perhaps for the first time, I would encourage you to visit the new uh, Newton GCRF website, where there are full details about the funds, uh, our delivery partners, and details of previous funding calls. So please. Uh, do check this out, uh, as well as following your relevant delivery partner for details of live calls. Uh, in the meantime, we thank you again to UK, uh, UKI for organising today's event, uh, and to you all for joining, uh, and I wish the chair, the panel and the audience a very successful event. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. 
Um, thank you for those opening remarks and uh, yeah, a very nice introduction, I think, to the different schemes um, and very candid about the, the future of Newton and GCRF. Um, so we all wait to with bated breath and, and hope, I think. Um, I definitely would underline that as somebody who's received um, funding in this area. Um, so thank you, Chris. Um, we're going to move on to our second speaker now. So I'd like to introduce um, John Young. He's the Executive Director of the International Network for Advancing Science and Policy in us. He has a vast experience of working and delivering uh, um, impact um, and, and action research. Um, so I'd like to invite you to start your presentation, please. Very good. Thank you very much, Louise. And thank you very much for um, inviting me to uh, this talk. Um, I don't seem to yet have the thing inviting me to share my screen. Yeah, we can see your slides, OK? okay and when brilliant. you can go to the, that's it, brilliant. There we go, OK. Um, very good. So I'm going to talk a bit about me, uh, where I come from, a bit about international development, how research can contribute to it, and I'm going to give you some examples of that. I'm going to talk about why it's difficult, uh, what you need to know to do it well, what is meant by impact, different people have different definitions, how to measure it, um, and then what else needs to be in place for, it, for research to be useful. And then I'm going to finish up by saying, if you want to do uh, uh, research on international development which is useful the sorts of things you ought to bear in mind uh, as you as you do it a little bit about me i spent uh, about 20 years in africa uh, and asia working on uh, field projects uh, animal health care projects trying out new ideas and seeing how they could be spread more widely since then 20 years in the uk looking at the interface between research and policy. How does research get into policy and practice? Most of them with the Overseas Development Institute in London, the last couple of years here with the International Network for Advancing Science and Policy in Oxford. Both of them have been really aiming to promote greater production and use of research-based evidence in development policy and practice. So some of the examples I'm going to talk about today come from my ODI time, some from the more recent time. I was told that some of you might not know very much about international development, so I thought I'd say a little bit about that to begin with. And uh, you know, I went to Google and I googled uh, what is international development, uh, and up this came up. This was this was the first hit, uh, which is the Concern uh, Worldwide, uh, one of the big Irish uh, international development charities. This is uh, their definition of what is international development, and it's actually rather good. Uh, international development focused on engaging with economically disadvantaged regions to empower people to improve their well-being and address um, the causes and effects of poverty. And it's actually really quite a nice picture. Uh, a lot of uh, pictures illustrating international development have, have uh, skinny babies and terrible examples of climate change. And actually, it really is about working with people. So I quite like the definition and I quite like uh, the image that goes with it. Of course, those of you who know about uh, international development will know it's much more complicated than that. And the United Nations, uh, obviously one of the biggest players in international de development, came up with the 17 goals for sustainable development in, 20, in 2015. And these, these are them. Um, I'm not going to go through them all in detail. But I think what's really interesting about these um, uh, goals is that some of them clearly focus on kind of improvements of livelihoods in developing countries. So no poverty, zero hunger, good health. Uh, but they also recognise that achieving them in developing countries will require changes in developed countries as well. So there are goals around responsible consumption and production, climate action uh, and partnerships. So going forward, uh, research on uh, issues which will affect uh, 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 the development of, of uh, poorer countries will actually need to focus increasingly on what we're doing in the north, uh, which affects what happens in, in the south. Um, and the first thing to realise is that development research funding is, is a very tiny amount of the overall investment in international development. So it's very difficult to get accurate figures on these. I might need to increase these figures um, based on what Chris, Mas Chris was saying earlier on. But the best figure I could get from about uh, three years ago is it's about £2 billion per year. Sounds like a lot of money, but if you put that into context, the overall official development assistance is about £130 billion a year. Whoops. The, um, Securities and export credits, £153 billion, uh, uh, actually dollars, not pounds a year. 
and then foreign direct uh, investment and grants about 162 uh, billion dollars and the largest single thing is actually remittances uh, to uh, the global south of uh, from uh, uh, people uh, living in the north so actually 0.2 billion is a very very tiny amount of the total external resource flows to development about 2.5 percent but actually it can have a, an astonishing impact and this is a trial plot of ir36 um, this is the rice variety developed by the international rice research institute it took them 15 years to develop it it's now the most widely grown a variety of food crop worldwide 11 million hectares are grown worldwide 65 percent of the rice grown in asia and it's enabled asian farmers to harvest an additional 5 million tons of rice each year and earn an additional 1 billion dollars annually and somebody once told me that the rate of return on this uh, improved variety of rice has more than paid for all of the uh, uh, research on international development uh, issues um, uh, since then i've ne never managed to uh, uh, get that figure um, uh, proven but right at the other end of the scale international development research can also have a massive impact locally M much smaller projects this is an example this is the tanzania uh, essential health improvement project this is a project in tanzania obviously uh, funded by the canadian uh, government much smaller project um, uh, and all it did was it looked at the disease prevalence in two districts, compared that with the national disease prevalence upon which the national healthcare programs were based, changed the healthcare programs in those districts to align more closely uh, with the disease prevalence identified by those surveys. And it achieved a massive uh, reduction in infant, infant mortality in just three years. So the right kind of research done in the right kind of way, even quite small uh, pieces of research, can have a, a massive uh, impact. And the rate of return on research can be huge as well. This is um, a calculation done of the rate of return of some work done by the Indian Institute of Dalit Studies on availability of higher education to Dalits, that's untouchables in India. And they calculated that a decision was made by the University Grants Committee in India to reserve 350,000 places for Dalits uh, over the next uh, five uh, classes. They estimated that would generate an additional $2.3 billion lifetime, lifetime income for those graduates. Then they just did a very simple sum, looking at how much was spent on the research which contributed to that policy change, uh, $250,000. So you have a rate of return of 9,000 uh, to one. So $1 resulted in, in, in $9,000 additional income. They did then look at the contribution that that research might have made to that policy change, uh, which they uh, reckoned uh, by doing a contribution analysis was about something like 48%. So even if you halve it, it's still a massive uh, rate of return. So the right kind of research done in the right way can have a massive uh, impact and uh, generate a huge rate of return. So it really is a, a good investment uh, to make in terms of uh, achieving international development goals. And if you want um, to see some other examples of where international development research has delivered um, uh, impressive impact, there's a whole load of success stories on the UK CDR uh, website. Uh, and I would urge you to go there and, and look at these examples. There are many examples where international research has, has had a huge, a huge impact. But it's not, it's not easy. Many development challenges are really difficult to address. Here are just some of them. These sorts of problems are often called wicked problems uh, because they're complex. Uh, many factors contribute to them. They're very difficult to solve. Uh, there's no simple solution. Actually, solving one part of the problem often creates, uh, exacerbates uh, uh, others. And long-term solutions nearly always involve social and political change. And that's, that's uh, always... Um, difficult and that's why Chris said that very often there's a 15 year time lag between a piece of research and, and any kind of impact. It's really, really difficult. Um, why is that? Um, if you want to address problems like this, uh, you really need to understand what's happening uh, on the ground. Things happen differently in different contexts. And here's a picture from uh, India and you can see the cow standing there in the middle of the road and all the traffic uh, just 
moves around around the cow. The, the cow knows that um, uh, drivers will always swerve to avoid hitting a cow, even if that causes a whole range of accidents uh, behind them. And India has a massive incidence of road traffic accidents. In Britain, drivers are told never to deviate uh, their course, never to cause any other vehicle to deviate their course or their speed, i.e. drive straight into the cow. Uh, animals on the road in Britain don't survive very long, but the accident rate is very, very much lower. And if you really want to make a difference with your research, you really need to understand how things happen uh, in the context you're working in and how things change. And how things change is really about changes in policy. So if you want to have change, you need to be thinking about how can we change policy and changing policy uh, is uh, fantastically difficult. Uh, and that's partly because there is no universal policy process. There are lots of different pictures of what a policy process looks like. This is the one which most people seem to uh, accept. It's a, sick, uh, uh, a cycle, policy formulation, decision making, implementation, monitoring the evaluation, then that goes around again, setting the agenda. But actually, many of these things uh, don't happen quite as neatly as that and actually there's relatively little monitoring evaluation of policies uh, anywhere and there are lots of different uh, organizations involved in this process uh, obviously um, the uh, line ministries uh, have a role in all of these stages in the process the cabinet ought to focus more on agenda setting policy formulation decision making but gets involved in others as does parliament and in if you're looking at international development work there are lots of other uh, actors also involved, so researchers, private sector and, and donors, and they're all trying to engage with these different stages of the process. So it's already starting to look quite complicated. And then donors, particularly over the last 10 years, have been trying to influence the other uh, stakeholders. Not surprisingly, in developing countries, they've been trying to get their own back. And very soon, everybody's trying to influence everybody. So it is incredibly complicated. We used to call this chaotic, uh, but we discovered that the chaos word is very unpopular, especially with policymakers. So we tend to say complex, multidimensional and non-linear, and they don't seem to mind that. But so this is the challenge of trying to influence policy if you want to, um, if you want your research to have any kind of impact. And of course, evidence and particularly research-based evidence is one of a very large number and often by far the smallest uh, uh, factor in a whole range of factors which uh, policy makers, decision makers need to take into account when they're making decisions. Their own experience, they apply their judgment, the resources available, uh, values, policy context, habits and tradition, the activity of lobbyists and pressure groups. These are all factors which policy makers are trying to take into account when they make decisions. So you need to recognise the research-based evidence is just one uh, and a relatively small part of that. This is actually a picture that was developed by a guy called Phil Davis, who was instrumental in promoting uh, evidence-based policy in the UK uh, in the uh, Labour um, uh, uh, Parliament in the early 2000s. Um, so what kind of research is likely to be able to work? And it, I think the best kind of research which is likely to have impact is transdisciplinary research. And let me explain what I mean by that. Um, disciplinary research, uh, academics work on particular research questions um, in isolation of, of often uh, published papers, uh, all very good, but often nobody reads them. Multidisciplinary research, researchers from different disciplines get together to look at related questions and maybe they share the results in conferences and start to share lessons amongst each other and that's a step in the right direction. Where it really starts to get interesting is with interdisciplinary research. So this is where different scientists from different disciplines actually get together collectively to address the same question and they share their approaches and they share their methods and they develop a research agenda together. Where it gets really powerful, I think, is when they do that in collaboration with all the other stakeholders in the process of so policymakers, businesses, practitioners and communities. Together, they identify what's the question here? What are the, what's the research we need to do? How can we do that research to answer those questions? And there's a process involved in this. So convening the stakeholders, identifying the problem, collaborative research. And then these two last bits are really important, co-analysis of results. It's not just the academics thinking, well, what can we learn from this? It's actually the academics and the other stakeholders sitting together and thinking, well, how does this help us solve this problem? And then co-production of recommendations. So it is 
transdisciplinary research which I think is likely to have the most impact. And if you want to do that, you need to be a bit more or work in a team with a wider range of skills. You obviously need to be a researcher doing uh, very good research, and this is Amartya Sen. Uh, you also need to be a really good storyteller to distill the results of that research into simple messages which policymakers can understand. This is Scheherazade telling the Sultan the story uh, so that he didn't cut off her head in the morning and after a thousand nights he married her. You also need to be a really good networker, make sure you know who else is involved in this process, who you can work with. You need to be a bit of an engineer. This is Isambard Kingdom Brunel, one of Britain's uh, leading uh, uh, engineers in the Industrial Revolution. You need to be thinking about what's the problem that's coming in the future? What research do I need to be doing now so that I'm ready with some evidence in the future? And you also need to be uh, what um, Simon Maxwell, who, uh, who was the director of ODI when I worked there, came up with this uh, concept of policy entrepreneurs. You need to be a bit of a political fixer. This is Rasputin. You need to understand the politics of um, what is happening so that you can engage uh, with the right political processes and make sure that your research gets to the right people at the right time uh, when they want to make the decisions. It's no good providing the results of research uh, after the decision has already been made. So that's why it's difficult and these are some of the ways of doing research which can, can make a difference. The next thing I want to talk about is impact. What is impact? Uh, well, there are lots of different definitions of impact. This is how the Economic and Social Research Council defines impact as a contribution to society and economy. Uh, that can be academic uh, or economic and societal impact. And the kinds of impact can in include instrumental impact. So that's influencing the development of policy practice or service provision, shaping legislation or altering behavior conceptual, contributing to the understanding of policy issues, reframing debates, and capacity building through technical and personal skill development. So this is how the UK RI uh, defines um, impact. Uh, here's another sort of set of definitions of what impact can look like. This is from uh, a really good website. Uh, if you want to ensure your research has impact maintained by a guy called Mark Reed at the University of Newcastle, you can find a huge range of information and guidance there. And he identifies this, these 10 uh, dimensions of, of impact. Uh, and he uh, also runs a whole load of training courses uh, on, on how to do that, um, particularly how to write really powerful uh, ref uh, impact case studies. So different dimensions of impact. And you need to be thinking about um, what you're trying to achieve uh, with, with your research. And sometimes it is about changing ideas. Sometimes it is about changing practice uh, and uh, and that will then determine the kinds of changes you want to see will will help you decide what kind of research do i need to do and then how do you measure it well fantastically difficult to measure the impact of research um, because of all the reasons i've explained it's a very small part of why decisions are made often classically uh, research impact has been measured through case studies uh, basically tracking forward from a piece of research to try and understand who was aware of it, who used it, uh, how did, how did, what happened next kind of thing. Uh, and this is a really good book. If you want to read some really good uh, uh, case studies of research, uh, read this book by Fred Carden on the IDRC website. They tend to overemphasize the role of research because crudely, if you go and talk to somebody, are you aware of this bit of research, uh, particularly a policymaker, they're very unlikely to say, no, I'm not aware of it. Um, the other way of looking at it, so that's the link if you want to look at that book, the other way of looking at it is some work that uh, we did back in ODI, uh, where we actually tracked back from a policy change, trying to understand what were the what was the uh, critical path which led to that policy change, when were decisions made, who was involved in making those decisions, what influenced those decisions, and what you tend to find in episode studies is that research. Um, is a relatively unimportant factor. It, it's usually the political or society changes which are the most important uh, process. So we need some way in between these two, which actually tries to get a true understanding of what research impact is. And uh, when I was at ODI, uh, that's a link to the, the second book. When I was at ODI, we did some work on that. And what we thought was, if you are involved in a research project and you want to be confident that you're on track to achieve an impact, you need to be looking at seven different levels. You need to be looking at your strategy in the direction. Are you doing the right thing? And uh, Chris talked earlier on about UK 
about um, GCRF having a theory of change. Their theory of change is how they think the research will contribute to these changes and periodically a theory of change will be reviewed to check whether that still kind of makes sense. So strategy and direction. The next one is management. Are you doing what you plan to do? Because very often projects start going in one direction, they end up going in a different direction, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. We ought to be adaptive and change the circumstances, but you need to understand why that change was made. Otherwise, at the end of the day, you don't know what it was that had the impact. Was it the original plan or, or, or the plan which evolved accidentally? And if it evolved sort of uh, accidentally, then how can you replicate that going forward? Outputs. Are you producing the right kind of outputs for your audience? Obviously, if you're trying to influence um, um, new ideas in academia, you need to be publishing uh, academic papers. If you're trying to influence the way that teaching is done in schools, you maybe need to be producing outputs which teachers and, and maybe students um, uh, uh, can use in order to change the way in which they interact in the classroom. Are the right people aware of your work? Uptake, no, there'll be no change if they're not. Outcomes, is this having any impact on policy? And by policy there, I mean broadly behavioural change. Is anybody's behaviour changing as a result of that? Number six, is that improving people's lives? Um, and number seven, you really need to understand the context. What else could be happening around the research that you're doing, which can contribute to the changes that you're observing? So you need to be tracking things at these different levels in order to be sure your research is on track to deliver what you hope uh, to, uh, you want to deliver. And um, as again, as Chris said earlier on, do some evaluations of research to find out really what impact that research had. And there's lots of different ways of doing this. I'm not going to talk about all of these. You can read all about them in this uh, in that guidebook if you want to know more about how to uh, influence research. And of course, uh, as I've already said, really, researchers are just part of the system. What we talk about in INASP is the knowledge ecosystem. A whole lot of other stakeholders are involved in the process of research communication and research uptake, and, and we call this a knowledge ecosystem. Here's a representation from our 1996 to 2020 strategy, all the different organisations, individuals involved in the middle. You can see our vision statement, research and knowledge at the heart of development. And what the recent, we believe that uh, sustainable knowledge ecosystems in the Global South are essential uh, for uh, uh, international development. And what the recent COVID crisis has illustrated is that it's vital to have these everywhere if we're going to deal with the challenges facing humanity, uh, even more the case in the developing countries, and they need their own knowledge ecosystems. So what we should be trying to do is to build knowledge ecosystems. The problem is that there are very many factors which undermine uh, knowledge ecosystems. Uh, uh, for example, uh, most of the research funding for development issues goes to universities in the global north. That which does go to the south tends to go to elite universities in capital cities. We need to get funding out to the universities, uh, the provincial universities, the universities actually doing practical work uh, in farmers' fields um, and with uh, emerging industries, etc. Um, women tend to find it very hard to pursue scientific careers in the south. Societal norms tend to keep them at home looking after the kids. If they do get into university, the teaching schedules are very inflexible, don't allow time for childcare. They have far less time to write papers, so often miss out in publication-driven promotion processes. Most of the well-known developed researchers are outsiders. Uh, voices of local researchers are often not heard. And this has all been made much worse by the COVID crisis, so we really need to invest more in building the whole ecosystem, as well as doing the right kind of research in the right way uh, in order to have some impact. So what do we mean by an equitable knowledge ecosystem where men and women have equal access, all academic and policy organisations have equal access to resources, all forms of knowledge are considered equally important, and um, where all stakeholders can collaborate to find evidence-based solutions to problems. So if you're a researcher wanting to do international development research in a way which is likely to have some impact, but what can you do? Well, the first thing to do is do the research on the challenges. Uh, you know, be looking much more at the developmental challenges faced in developing countries rather than the sort of academic questions which emerge uh, out of uh, an academic um, 
uh, research into international development as a kind of theoretical concept. Make sure that the research is contributing to um, uh, developmental problems. Do it in the right way. I've talked about transdisciplinarity. Be politically aware. Be patient. It does take a long time to, to get the results. Very unlikely that you and your research alone will have an impact. It's about collaborating with others um, and sharing results and working together on a particular problem. And then I think we think in, in us, you need to promote equity. Choose partners, not just in the elite universities in the South, Cho choose the research partners who are, who are actually engaged with the practical problems rather than the academic uh, questions. Uh, very often they're in the provincial universities. Work equitably with them. Uh, there is sometimes, I think it's reducing, but a tendency for uh, researchers in uh, Northern universities to regard their southern partners as, as people that will collect, do the field work and collect data, and they then analyze it and they publish the papers. Make sure that it's an equitable partnership with, with southern researchers and build capacity building into the process. Um, make sure that you leave your partners in a better position to do uh, useful research in a useful way uh, in their national context uh, after your research project is finished. And um, that's it. Uh, feel free to get in touch uh, by email if you'd like uh, any more information. I have left behind a set of slides, uh, an annotated set of slides with sort of notes pages, so you can look at that. You can see what I meant to have said, even if I didn't say it, and it has links to all these other resources uh, uh, if you're interested. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. That was a brilliant presentation. Um, I wish I'd had that a few years ago before we <laughs> got into this type of research fully. Um, so brilliant. Um, right, I'm going to encourage people to continue to send in questions. Um, but while we wait for a few more to come in, I've got, I've got some to get us going, John, if that's all right. Um, so to start with, you mentioned a number of impact success stories. Um, could you tell us what makes these projects um, in particular stand out for you in terms of impact? What makes them incredibly successful in your mind? Um, I think it is, it's really about changes in the way that things happen. I mean, the first thing to say is that I'm a practitioner by nature. So the, the, the ones which I tend to identify as successful are the ones that I actually know about at first hand, really. Um, so they, these are examples which I have worked on, which I think have, have gone well and have, have um, uh, uh, had an impact at, at many different levels, at changing uh, ideas, at changing practice. So, for example, I worked for a long time in, in Indonesia on decentralised animal health care. The big problem in Indonesia at that time was that all government services were centrally planned and just delivered uh, at, um, in the uh, provinces and the districts according to the central plan, regardless of what farmers wanted. What we were working on was a, a way of what we call client-oriented services, uh, tailor them to what the particular needs are in, in the country. And the other conceptual problem was that all the government staff thought they knew everything and farmers didn't know anything. So we needed to change the way that people think. Uh, so the government staff need to be recognising that farmers have useful skills, need to bring them together in order to identify what the new services uh, could do and then to figure out how to do them together. So the examples which I tend to like are ones which show that kind of degree of change in the way that people think, the way that people behave and actually result in practical changes on the ground. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and I've got a follow-up question for this that, I mean, both you and Chris have mentioned that it might take up to 15 years to um, be able to see impact from some of the research we undertake. Um, I just wonder if you've got any hints and tips for how maybe academic research should, should try and chart their impact when we've got projects that might last between three to five years, if we're lucky. Um, I think I partly de it depends how you define impact. And I think this is uh, one of the challenges which people face. I think, I think if people are realistic about the kind of impact which is achievable, within the time frame of their particular project, it is, it is possible to achieve impact, even if it's only just changing the discourse on a particular issue in a particular place. So uh, uh, there are projects which have been funded by um, 
um, GCRF, which are looking at, for example, changes in attitudes towards insurance uh, provision for farmers, um, climate, um, sort of rainfall insurance for, for farmers. Uh, and that project was very successful at just changing the way which government thought about and the insurance companies thought about how insurance should be provided. There wasn't very much change in terms of actual uh, insurance, uh, uh, new uh, uh, models of insurance being provided and certainly no changes yet at field level, but actually there was a very demonstrable change in attitude uh, at the top, which would then affect what was happening later on. So I think thinking about being re realistic about what you can achieve within the lifespan of a project, and there's a really good uh, method developed by IDRC, the International Development Research Centre in Canada, uh, called outcome mapping, which recognises that ex explicitly, you know, the lifetime of a project is relatively short, you might have a very ambitious goal, let's be realistic about what is possible to achieve as we go along and to identify these step-by-step -step changes, and then you can track progress along those changes. So in terms of the personal satisfaction and personal confidence that you are contributing, I think by being realistic uh, about what's achievable within the lifetime of a project. At the other end, I think what's clear uh, is that it, it is often uh, the biggest impact comes from uh, collaborations, uh, people working together on a particular issue over, over a number of years. And one of the things I've been impressed with uh, working with uh, colleagues in universities is the ability to maintain a set of relationships uh, with uh, students, often they start as students and they go back home, they become more and more senior in their, um, in their governments or in academia in their home country. And by retaining those relationships over a very long period of time, you can actually build up a kind of network and a body of knowledge which can be hugely influential. So I think be realistic in the short term, but then think uh, um, broadly and uh, uh, treasure and maintain your relationships through your career. Thank you, that's a brilliant answer. Um, so I've got another question for you here. Um, you mentioned that we should anticipate the future impact requirements to pursue that research now. Do you have any insights as to how we should go about this? Um, yeah, well, uh, as I said uh, earlier on, my, my uh, I remember things best that I've been involved in. So that project in Indonesia I was talking about um, was looking at uh, livestock service provision and it was quite clear at that time, it, Indonesia was highly centralized, um, Suharto was in power, there was no way that uh, um, services were likely to be decentralized and made more client oriented within his tenure, but it was quite clear that that era was going to come to an end at some point. So what actually it was the British government funded project, what uh, uh, DFID as it was at that time, FCDO now, thought, well, well, let's try some experiments. Let's just try some experiments at field level to see whether we can get some of these more client-oriented services up and running. And they kind of very deliberately went under the radar, if you like. They capitalized on the relationships they had with, with livestock service staff at district level in, in, East, in Eastern Indonesia, just to try to get some examples up and running. And that was fine. Uh, they, they worked quite well. And then, of course, uh, Suharto uh, got kicked out, Habibi came in, suddenly there was this huge pressure from government to decentralise services. And look, uh, we have, we've actually got some examples of what works, uh, and they were sort of adopted very widely, and the sort of principles underpinning them about um, engagement with local communities uh, 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 got uh, built into what was called the, the, the district level development plan, which was funded by the World Bank and a whole load of other donors. So, DFID saw this opportunity coming, thought, well, what do we need to do to prepare for it? Well, let's get some examples, because the policymakers really like living examples. Let's do the examples, and then if the opportunity comes along, we'll have some evidence to present. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm going to change tack slightly with the next question. How can we measure impact of more qualitative work, for example, in changing attitudes, reframing approaches? Um, could we, should we translate those into more quantitative? project impact um, and is that a good way of measuring impact achieved? Well what I what I really like doing is quantifying qualitative impact I mean I think it is very difficult to quantify things like that but um, I think stories are really good and uh, people like telling stories and there's a really good method called stories of change 
So you can ask uh, people uh, either who have been involved in a project or working in an area where a project is working, um, what what has changed recently in how you do X, whatever whatever X is, and collect collect those stories, and uh, and then you can actually uh, um, analyze them. Uh, and we've often done that using uh, in vivo or max QDA, sort of qualitative text analytical tool, and you can actually uh, derive from that quantitative evidence of the sorts of changes which people are talking about and the sorts of reasons which people are giving for those behaviours to change. So I think quantifying qualitative uh, uh, um, uh, evidence is a really powerful way of both telling a story, because you've got the examples, uh, and also you've got the numbers to prove it. Lovely, thank you. Um, there's one here um, that's asking, as a practitioner, what's your opinion of using log frames in research projects? Are they oh, a good way? <laughs> did, did, uh, 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 you have you have sparked a, a, a very strong personal interest of mine. I think log frames are great, provided they're done properly. The, the principle behind a log frame is it's a collaborative exercise with all the stakeholders who are involved in trying to do something. What are we trying to contribute to here, which is the goal? What is it realistic for us working together to achieve? And that's the purpose. What do we need to do that? These are the outputs. What are the things which can help or hinder us and these are the assumptions and it's a collaborative process and uh, it's reviewed uh, annually and um, changed as necessary it's a sort of living tool but what has tended to happen with log frames uh, since they were first introduced by diffid back in the gosh i don't know the late 80s probably is that they have become a kind of um, uh, uh, backroom exercise at the end of a, of a project design mission you draw a framework you fill in some numbers so all the kind of collaborative stuff is lost and they tend to get filled up with quantitative indicators and then whoever's doing the work is held to account to the to deliver the quantitative indicators so it's lost that fundamental principle theories of change are supposed to now if you look at how theories of change they're supposed to be the much better than log frames um, actually they're going the same way i think the principles behind the theory of chain and log frame are exactly the same collaborative working with all the different stakeholders uh, reviewed regularly flexible uh, responsive to change all this kind of stuff and i think there's a real risk that theories of change are going to go the same way that log frames have gone over the years they become a pretty picture that you get together and draw as the last bit of a design mission when you're designing a project or designing a research project and actually What's really important is everybody getting together to decide what is the problem here, what do we need to do here, uh, what's possible, what's achievable within the framework of this project. We talked a bit about that earlier on. Being very clear about that, then reviewing it regularly going forward. Log frames are great for that if they're done right. Theories of change are great for that if, if they're done right. Uh, IDRC um, has a, a planning uh, uh, methodology based on outcome mapping, which I talked about earlier on that's very much built into that into that uh, method as well what's important is the process and the inclusiveness of the process and the flexibility of the process now, as soon as they become frameworks or boxes connected with lines you start to lose that flexibility i think brilliant thank you thank you ever so much john i think we need to move to our panel discussion although i'm sure we could carry on talking to you with lots more questions thank you john is staying for our panel discussion as well so uh, there will be uh, another opportunity to ask other questions of him so thank you very much john yeah thank you very much right and now i'd like to invite our other panelists to join um for our discussion um so we've got three others who are going to join us the first person i'd like to introduce um is um professor tally palmer um, so she's joining us um, from Rhodes University in South Africa, where she's the director of the Institute for Water Research and the African Research Universities Alliance um, for Water Centre of Excellence. So, so thank you. I'd like to invite you now, Tali, to give us a few words, please. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Louise, for the introduction. And um, John, really enjoyed listening to you and lots of resonance there. So the Institute for Water Research is at Rhodes University, which is a small provincial university in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. It's quite a poor region. It's a research strong university and looks a lot at developing postgrad research. 
And the Water Center of Excellence, which we host from the African Research Universities Alliance, has got nine nodes, nine universities who collaborate, three in South Africa, and one each in Senegal, Nigeria, um, Uganda, Rwanda, Ethiopia, and Tanzania. And all of us have worked together to say that what we want to do is to work together producing research that is used on a trajectory towards social and ecological justice, putting social and ecological justice together. Interestingly, from a UKRI point of view, this is the first set of funding where the PI and the research administration is outside of the UK. So they're looking at us as something of a guinea pig. Now, how did we get to the kind of work that the, that the, um, that the um, Water Centre of Excellence hopes to do in their resilient benefits from African, res sorry, resilient benefits from African water resources, looking at the SDGs and making them real in Africa? Well, early experience came from putting research into the South African water law reform process and getting both a global first for an environmental water right and rights for local people in terms of potable water. Moving on with uh, um, working with the Netherlands Alternatives in Development, trying to put together how you can have excellent irrigated citrus and local people with completely inadequate water supply. Working most recently in degraded landscapes and um, uh, landscapes that have ceased to provide good livelihoods for people and how you build both restoration and ecological livelihoods. Now the question is how? And the way we've done it is to understand from an academic point of view what is meant by a complex social ecological system. So John, listening to your complexity, putting science as social and ecological together and being committed to the practice of transdisciplinary research. And I don't need to talk about that now. But one of the key things is to value relationality and to realize that if you have not embedded the community you are working with for their benefit into local governance structures, formal government and government structures, whatever they are, then when you leave, you haven't left local people able to use the science you have in worked with them to develop. And this is with so important to look at that co-development of learning and knowledge and co-practicing together, valuing and respecting all the different knowledge forms. So what we've done is we've put this together into something we've called the adaptive systemic approach, which packages a lot of these ideas into something that a research team, a community and local government and governance can work with. And this is the way we work. Um, I haven't been keeping track of time, but just quickly to say that it sounds really good, it is incredibly hard. This is not the easy option in research. It takes a long time. And there are real barriers in terms of academic performance and barriers in terms of timeframes of research funding. And we need to grapple with these to make this a more likely way of working. Thanks so much. Lovely, thank you, Tally. And that was, that was spot on your time. <laughs> um, so next I'm going to introduce um, our next panellist who is Dr Tiziana Ulian. So I'd like to invite her to again come and give us um, um, a, a short introduction to herself. Um, yeah, good morning uh -huh. everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Louise. It's really a pleasure uh, to be here in this uh, panel. And um, yeah, I would like to, to tell you a bit uh, about myself first. I, yeah, I'm Tizian Ulian. I lead the, the diversity and livelihoods team within the natural capital department of the Royal Botanic Garden, Q. So as many of you might know, uh, Q is a global resource for plant and fungi knowledge and uh, contain the largest and uh, most diverse collection on plant and fungal specimen. So we have over, for example, 30,000 taxa in the living collection and more than 8 million herbarium specimens and also seed a section 
uh, so seed uh, collection, which are uh, stored at the Millennium Seed Bank, where I actually base now. Um, uh, in my team, uh, we, we carry out very much research on all these plant and fungal diversity. We look at the uses um, of this diversity with the aim of delivering a nature-based solution to improve community livelihood and uh, improve human well-being. And this is in line with many of the sustainable development goals. Um, so our research uh, is about looking at the traditional knowledge that is on the ground there on the plants and fungi and their uses. Um, we study the seed biology and ecology of species and uh, this enables us to support uh, landscape restoration and reforestation activity as well as uh, to help enhancing food security and promote uh, uh, sustainable agriculture. Um, through our work, uh, more recently, we are working in Colombia to help the development of national bioeconomy, the national economy in Colombia, which I'm going to mention later with uh, some of the projects we are involved there. And our role is really to connect uh, this knowledge of plant diversity um, and to look into way of uh, developing income generation activity uh, of local community through the conservation and use of this uh, biodiversity. Um, we work on, on the ground um, through long-standing collaboration. And I would say uh, this is really key of our work and it really takes time as it came out uh, um, in the earlier presentation to build these strong collaborations. Uh, we mainly work across Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East, um, but also we carry out some more global analysis, drawing on all our collections and the data set linked to this collection, such as uh, uh, the global analysis that uh, I recently did within the State of the World Plant and Fungi um, report, which was uh, published in September recently where I look at all the edible plants uh, by compiling all these different data sets. Um, uh, in our work, knowledge exchange is central um, um, to our work. And for this, we apply a participatory approach by working with local community and uh, collaborators from the start. So through the consultation, co-design and co-delivery of project activity and outcomes. Um, we, in order to give the information back, we also uh, carry out participatory training workshop. Uh, we provide uh, a wide range of technical and scientific advice um, uh, to support uh, the, the practical work on the ground and uh, work with local NGO to make sure that all our knowledge and experience can benefit local community directly and directly. Um, so here I'm just going to mention some of the projects. One past project, <laughs> which uh, is very much uh, um, close to my heart, is the Yusuf Plan project that uh, we deliver in Botswana, Kenya, Mali, South Africa, and Mexico. So it's um, uh, in, in, in two, um, uh, in two regions of the world. And uh, the, with, through this project, we announced the exit to conservation uh, and the use of indigenous useful plants that are important for the local community for food, medicine, construction, and so on. Uh, the main beneficiary here were the local community themselves, tens of them, uh, that had increased uh, capacity, their capacity through the project to successfully conserve and use the species sustainably. Uh, we jointly established a plant nursery um, and local community garden. And uh, through the plant material, uh, seeds and seedling, we support agriculture and forestry activity and also help developing income generation, as I said, through uh, the identification of key species, which can be um, use uh, to develop sustainable value chain locally, nationally, internationally. Um, so uh, this is really um, one of the main output of uh, this project was the production of a book which is called Wild Plants for a Sustainable Future, which is available online, where we managed to bring together all the information uh, the knowledge, the local knowledge, our uh, knowledge, compi the knowledge compiled from the literature and the one that we generated through the project, all together 
410 species uh, in order um, to um, really help uh, um, practitioners to use this wider diversity uh, for a development project in the agriculture, forestry or conservation sector. Um, more recently, um, I've been involved, uh, I'm involved uh, uh, in developing project in Colombia and Mexico. We really have a program both in Colombia and Mexico. Um, in Colombia, in particular, um, we have been delivering um, uh, 11 projects. I would like uh, to mention um, the one that uh, we have started, and we are at the second year of implementation, which is the use of plants and fungi of Colombia. This is uh, funded by the Newton Caldas Fund, um, which is the partnership uh, of Fund Between Base and the um, um, relevant uh, uh, counterpart in Colombia. And the overall goal of this project is to develop pathways to enhance nature contribution to people in Colombia. Uh, so there is one part more on bioinformatics because we really want to bring together all this knowledge about use of plants and fungi. We always talk about the importance of biodiversity uh, to support livelihood, but uh, we really want to know where is this biodiversity, what is this biodiversity. So we really bring all this information together. And there is a second part of the project where we are going to focus on key species uh, in order uh, to really uh, develop value chain that can benefit the local economy, but also, of course, the national economy, economy but potentially, of course, the international economy. So with the, um, helping really to identify these, uh, these key species. Um, another project in Colombia that we have just finished, which is funded by the UK Pact, again, <laughs> through BASE, um, uh, is called Promoting Forest Protection and Peace Building Through Community-Based Ecotourism. So our uh, role there, we are working with a, lot, with a national NGO and we are working with, uh, um, uh, with the tourism sector, uh, both in Colombia, but also here in the UK, to develop ecotourism activities and uh, uh, new tours in areas that they were before uh, belonged to conflict areas. So to give an, alter an alternative to the local community. And our, um, our role there is to come up with the information about this biodiversity, in particular, plants and fungi. The last project I would like to mention, I think time is running, <laughs> is running out, is, uh, okay, <laughs> I can see. So it's, uh, in, in Mexico, we also have um, a big program. Um, and at the moment, uh, through the Newton Funds, um, uh, I'm leading a, a project um, uh, called, uh, um, um, it's uh, called Conserving Native Useful Trees of Mexico to maintain its natural capital, which has the aim to support forestry, uh, community-based reforestation program in Mexico in the area of Veracruz, which is a coffee, coffee area, important economically, nationally, but global at the international level. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. That was a lovely tour of lots of your work there. Um, so our fourth panellist, um, who I'm going to introduce now, um, is Dr Ian Mabbott, who's an Associate Prof Professor at Swansea University. Um, so I'm just going to invite Ian um, to introduce himself. Um, over to you. Uh, thanks for the introduction and hello everyone. Uh, yep, so I'm a, I'm a chemist and a materials engineer at Swansea. And my background was originally in uh, sort of focused on speeding up industrial processes um, so this kind of evolved into uh, work on functional coatings and materials for energy as those as those industries evolve themselves. Um, but from there, I started to work on projects in water, sanitation, and hygiene um, in developing nations uh, via the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And that's where I began to understand the need to partner both in country and across disciplines to, to build a deeper understanding of, of a problem and a context before even attempting to sort of engineer a solution. Um, I think actually, you know, sometimes in, in science and engineer, and engineering, even in the kind of applied parts, we take the background for granted. Um, if, a, if an industry or, you know, if you're in industrial research, a company has a problem, they've usually developed that problem up from the voice of the customer. It's been translated into a commercial or a business case for change. And then the engineers are brought in with quite a tight specification um, in order you know, to, to work on. So 
I think that when you start working on a in a challenge led space and, and you're looking at to do something transformative, all of that background doesn't really exist yet. It's emerging. And I think, you know, one of the key things that I, that I learned from this process is the need to partner up with people and connect to that um, to that background as it emerges. So now I'm part of the team which um, uh, which leads a, a GCRF funded project called Sunrise. And this builds on you know, decades long associations between industry and academia across the UK and, and initially India, where the aim is uh, to create rural buildings that, that generate, store and release their own renewable energy and use that to improve energy access, which has associated sort of benefits in well-being, uh, of course, things like water access as well. Um, and, and can provide economic opportunities and, and reduce climate impact of, of those sort of settlements. Um, but that builds on uh, a UKRI funded specific knowledge, uh, innovation knowledge centre in, uh, in the UK where we develop these kinds of active buildings for, for our context and also uh, a Newton Prize winning um, Apex uh, solar energy network across the UK and, and Indian academic partners. Um, I guess you know what's been interesting there is that we're, we're constantly growing capacity. So you know we, we've been learning a lot as we go along, um, and we've recognised and started to fill a, fill gaps in areas around the social sciences to, to deeply understand the problems, uh, and also building a network of, of NGO partners and also industrial supply chains so that whatever solutions we come up with are scalable beyond beyond our project. Um, and, you know, likewise, we've started to spread geographically. Uh, and this is this is something I really like because, you know, now with our Indian partners, uh, they're, they're helping us to build capacity in South Africa, Mexico and Kazakhstan. And uh, and we've got a few more places in the pipeline where we're working on on new relationships. Um, what's sort of unusual, I guess, is how we span the, the sort of technology readiness level. So working from really basic research in, in new materials discovery um, through to sort of technological scale up. You know, how do we make these things at a, at a reasonable scale where they become useful? So there's both, you know, if we look at solar energy, that could be, you know, moving from uh, a couple of millimeter area of, uh, of, a, of a hero cell in a lab um, through to being able to produce, you know, meters squared, which are usable in, in a community um, and also the processes that go with that. And the idea there is, again, we can start to initiate supply chains so that these materials become available. But then we go right through to NGOs and, and people working in the field and on the ground and, and, and creating um, uh, the, the uh, the sorts of buildings and interventions that we need, and the idea there, which I which I really like, is that we start to build a feedback loop that shapes development of of the technologies. It makes them appropriate. And um, if we were to take, say, energy storage, for example, if you, you know, if uh, the, the the sort of uh, scientists in the audience may do a quick literature review search and find out what people have been working on, what's hot in energy storage, and it's all about, you know. Uh, electric mobility, portable electronics, uh, increasing uh, power densities and specific energy. But then when you talk to an NGO working on a microgrid in a community, you understand that um, that you know there's there's a, an ongoing cost associated with a microgrid. So they build an energy um, a sort of an energy committee which hold the funds. They they price energy, and you ask them, you say, well, what are you pricing for? If, if the thing's been donated, what are you pricing for? Well, they're pricing for maintenance and they're pricing for battery replacement. And that's the big cost. And that comes in five years time. So if you feed that back to the people in the lab, you can say, well, you know, maybe not not worry about um, specific energy right now and, and make this thing last 10 years. And then we can uh, we can change the whole dynamic of that energy community. So it's that feedback loop right back to the people developing technology, which I, I think uh, enhances the route to impact and, and ca capacity and capability across the whole part of the chain and um, connecting everyone more closely. So I guess the final thoughts from me are that in terms of impact, there are challenges in, in recognizing this, both underestimating and overestimating. Because impact is about that change, and that change takes time. 
so often people will overstate an output as a uh, as an impact and um, they aren't asking themselves so what but on the flip side of it is is recognizing when you're starting to have an impact and i think this came up in in the question that john answered really well um, because if you take our project, for example, we're on a journey developing our first full building now, uh, which will have a tangible impact on the community. But we're ambitious, so we want to light the touch paper for thousands of examples of people to follow this uh, around the world. That's what we want. So where, at what point in that is the impact? And, and in the meantime, we've developed some small microgrids in schools and primary healthcare settings near Bangalore, which are having an impact on lives now. And in Mexico, we've been working with uh, local T-shirt printing companies, so small cottage industries, to look at how they can modify their processes to print solar cells instead of T-shirts or alongside T-shirts. Um, but the impact then, you know, there's also this impact on, on the personal stories of change. The connections that we're making are moving people towards transdisciplinary working, uh, which, again, John highlighted really nicely in, in his talk. Um, and and you know I think I've got a personal story of change there because because over the last couple of years this has become uh, really a part of who I am and and I'm proud that we've actually been a part of an OEC case OECD case study of transdisciplinary working. Uh, still areas to grow and I think that storytelling is key here. So shifting imagery, especially around climate and planetary health, from this kind of dystopian outlook to to a narrative of hope. And I, I think that if we can join all of that together, then then we can uh, we can all have an impact together. So that's my intro. Lovely. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, so we're going to move to um, questions now. Um, so I've got some that are asking um, questions to specific individuals and others that we'll let you all come in on. Um, so the first one, I mean, I'm actually going to invite Chris Muskell back to join us. Um, so I'm hoping the technology works now. Um, because we have a question to him, um, which is asking, what are the core differences between Newton Fund um, and GCRF with other more general international development, such as different approaches? Um, so what's important to generating new knowledge, new theory in the funding decision? So over to Chris, thank you. Uh, great, yeah, thank you very much. And thank you to all of the, of the panelists for those, uh, those interesting uh, presentations. I think they're all fascinating. Um, the specific question, so how do we differ? So I talked, I think, in my earlier comments about uh, the fact that gross national income, the 0.7% which goes on on, uh, on ODA is about £15 billion pounds a year. And that's a very broad spectrum, what we would call the budget, a very broad spectrum, everything from sort of very conventional, what you think of sort of dipping on the ground programmes, all the way through to, I guess, what we're doing, which is much more focused on, on sort of lower middle income countries. It's countries with science base. It's leveraging science to solve global development challenges. It is, it is a very much sort of, you know, one end of the spectrum in terms of, in terms of that, that whole piece of, of development support. But uh, and it's important that, you know, we recognise that we, we do play one role in the whole spectrum of support as well. You know, you would not want to put all of your funding Odor into that one area, you know, it is it is it is a spectrum, and, and yeah, other departments do take the lead. Uh, so uh, what was DFID uh, do do uh, uh, research innovation, uh, typically at sort of a, a, a more systems and sort of uh, uh, capacity building level. Uh, health do an awful lot of, of research development as well, taking the lead on their sort of health programs. Uh, and Bayes obviously leverages the fact that we have relationships with the science base, with, with sort of UKRI and that sort of. The academies and, and, and the bodies that we sort of fund and support to, to leverage sort of the, the, the core science. Uh, so I would say that the, the big difference is that, is that where we focus, we play more with sort of middle income, low middle income countries who have an existing science base. I think that's, that's the sort of space that we, we play in. Uh, in terms of the question about funding decisions, uh, we have a delegated delivery model. Bayes doesn't decide what gets funded and what doesn't. It's, this, it's the research base that decides that through competitive courts and, and you know, projects are evaluated, you know, according to their, their excellence and, and, and their impact. Uh, but, it, you know, you would need to, to see the individual criteria which each each, uh, each council applies to, to make the funding decisions. Lovely. Thank you very much, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, the next question is specifically for Tally. Um, so I think we've got some people in the audience that would be very keen um, to work with Arua. So the question is, how can how can they work with you and maybe get in touch with you to to initiate some collaborative research? Oh, we can't hear you now to hear Tally. We we'll just give Tally a moment to see if she can. <laughs> Can 
No, still nothing, Tally. What I might do, Tally, is move on to another question and then give me a thumbs up when you're back and we'll come back to you. <laughs> so, um, so we're going to move on to a question and this is for all of the panel, so I'll see who wants to come in first. Um, what advice would you give to early career researchers on how to identify a challenge driven research um, like people have talked about? Um, would anybody like to volunteer to take that one? I, I can um, do it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. I think um, I think one of the keys here is, you know, um, whilst whilst talking and, and I'm a big advocate of transdisciplinary work in, I think one of the, the key things is to recognize your own discipline well and your own skill set and expertise and and have a, you know, a, a good think about what impact you can you can derive from your knowledge and your skill set. And then the really challenging part, I guess, but the important part is to start to, to link up early, even before there's a, a funding call out, start to link up early with, with people in country where that challenge can uh, and, and the context can grow. Because I think one of the issues that you'll often get is that there'll be a scramble when a call comes out. And you know, uh, people will be trying to make a new relationship whilst filling in a, a proposal. And I think you need a, a bit of a runway into that. So as many possible networking events and uh, and inter, you know, particularly international, which is being facilitated by the pandemic in a sense, because you know that might have involved a lot of travel and a lot of travel grants uh, until quite recently. Now all of these things are online. So get yourselves to them and 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 listen and and hear what challenges are out there, and then link that back to your skill set, and then connect to people because that they they're always going to be the key. Thank you, Ian. Um, John, over to you. Uh, just yes, uh, I agree entirely uh, with that. Um, uh, there's a really good thing which I don't quite understand called the GCRF QA fund. My understanding is that universities get an, a, an additional little pot of GCRF money to do kind of uh, preliminary work on, on uh, uh, global challenges. And that seems to be a really good place to look. If you just want to get started in this area, try and find out if your university has got a QA fund, find out what the processes are to apply for that. And uh, as Ian says, think about what could be the sort of practical uh, development applications of my work and just see whether you could get some seed funding out of that. But I agree entirely with what Ian says about being getting in the networks. There are lots of other um, uh, websites out there which provide uh, information and advice about these sorts of things. The UK CDR uh, Bond uh, Preserves These NGOs has quite a thriving research area. There are quite a lot of websites around which, which list calls. The IDRC I talked about, for example, Thank you. Um, I'm going to see if Tally, have you fixed your audio problems? No, we haven't. <laughs> Can you hear me? That's it. Brilliant. No. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Right. Um, we, we do have a website, so you can find us um, with all of our different nodes on that. Um, obviously, from the webinar, you can connect with, uh, you know, from, I presume, the organisers can put, um, for example, my contact details. The, the Water Centre of Excellence is really interested in meeting with people who would like to co-find research calls that we can work together on. So the different nodes do have different areas of expertise. We do all of us together try and work in this transdisciplinary way, and we'd be really happy to hear from people and do the hard work of co-creating project proposals for co-funding. Brilliant, thank you. So you're going to get a flurry of emails and contacts now. <laughs> um, I've got a question now that almost follows on from the, the, the one that Ian and John have, have spoken to. Um, there's somebody noting that interdisciplinary and particularly transdisciplinary work has been mentioned a lot um, in, the, in the presentations and introductions. Um, and a concern may be that obviously still as academic researchers, we tend to be discipline based. Um, so they're wondering if anyone has any advice how to sort of negotiate that interrelationship. Tally. Um, I think 
I've lived through a career where people have said we won't have transdisciplinary, soft, mushy, um, less than excellent putting of things together that don't constitute dis um, academic excellence. And the challenge of transdisciplinarity is to be disciplinarily excellent and to place that excellent knowledge into context in ways that connect with the people who are going to use them so that you create questions together with people and you put excellent ways of doing things into places where they can be used. And you do that work among different disciplines with communities and into governance contexts. And I think that's why I said it's not easy. It's hard and it means you have to create that set of relationships to make those things work. Brilliant, thank you. John? Well, oh, Tiziana uh, yeah. also has her hand up. <laughs> well, okay. Go to Tiziana first, go Tiziana. Okay, thank you, John. Um, yeah, I also, to really link up to um, uh, what also John and Ian said before, and of course, uh, Telly, I think it's, it's really key to uh, develop strong partnership. I think that has been really one of uh, the big assets that we have in our project. And you need to build this partnership, not just at the academic level, because at the academic level, okay, that allows you to carry out and to deliver excellency in science, but also with the practitioners. So, for example, as I, as I mentioned, both in our work in Colombia and Mexico, we're linking up with local NGO. But at the same time, also, local NGO is not enough. You need, you need also to look at the private sector, government, of course. In Colombia, we're very much working in line with the National Development Plan. So for us, uh, for the success, because the, the point of view that we have from here can be sometimes very different from the point of view in country. And the only way you can really have a very uh, real <laughs> um, you know, point of view and uh, you know, a very uh, pragmatic approach is really by working with the collaborator in country. So you need to build this collaboration from the beginning and nurture them and understand all the context your project uh, uh, is being developed. Thank you. Would you like to come in too, John? Uh, uh, yes. Um, I think what I was going to say is, is I've been having a long, a long-standing debate with with uh, an academic I respect hugely. I'm not going to give uh, the name. Who 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 feels the problem is that there that transdisciplinarity is not recognised, and she wants to make transdisciplinarity. Um, a, a discipline in its own right and my argument is as soon as you do that you undermine what uh, Tally was talking about you undermine the fact that transdisciplinarity means, means bringing together the people from different disciplines to share their methods and their approaches and stuff so I don't think there should be a sort of uh, transdisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity should be recognized as disciplines in their own right but I do think that the uh, disciplinary journals need to be more prepared to publish uh, transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary research and there needs to be much more championing of the value of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research which will encourage them to do that and there are some bodies who are starting to do that for example the international science council is starting to promote that although they interestingly say of course traditional knowledge is not science uh, and i was very pleased to hear what tally was saying earlier on uh, i feel I'm, i might have a, a colleague there to fight that battle uh, with them um, so i think the more that and um, GCRF uh, um, is is inherently transdisciplinary in its approach. So the more that research donors, the more that academia recognises it, the more that the journals, through which through publications in which uh, early career researchers gain promotion, mm -hmm. uh, th mm -hmm. that's really where we need to spend effort is is creating opportunities for people to publish uh, transdisciplinary research in in disciplinary journals. Yeah, and I think I'm going to add to this, I'm going to take chair's privilege, but um, I think you could um, look at people that have had successful academic careers um, who have negotiated um, working in that way. Um, and if you look at their CVs, you will often find quite an interesting mix of publications that are either, you know, some might be aimed at their discipline for purposes like REF, others will be much more in this transdisciplinary way of working. Um, so it might be picking out some people that you do like the work of and you think have made a success and, and looking at how they've done it. Um, thank you. I've got a follow-up question um, now. 
um, for Tiziana. Um, how challenging was it to develop a translational research um, project from fundamental science, i.e. taking that fundamental plant science through to improve improvements in, in value chains? Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, I think, again, as, as I said in, in my small introduction, it's very key uh, to start from the beginning, um, really consulting not only your collaborator, but also the community, uh, because I think uh, um, it's not useful to, the, to do a, a kind of research that is not useful. <laughs> and so you really need to understand uh, really what you research for. Uh, we really link up fundamental research to drive practical work. Uh, but also, um, I, uh, I want to bring uh, <laughs> a, a small communication I had with one of our collaborators in Jordan, that is uh, the general manager of, um, of a national park that they really uh, carry out conservation activity, but at the same, also, the same time, they link with the community, local community, uh, to develop income generation activity. And he, keeps saying, uh, he kept saying, yeah, um, we really value research very much. But also, when the research is carried out that it, and is used uh, really to support our action, conservation action, development action, sometimes it's not clear how to use the research. So it's great, but how to use it? So it is really important that we don't forget uh, to incorporate into the project cycle, you know, the part where you translate this, uh, this research uh, for a for a practical um, you know for, for a practical objective, and and that's really you know as a researcher we still need to be there and working with the practitioners and to be able to translate our research into practice. Otherwise, it will just remain into very beautiful, nice paper. But this 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 knowledge really need to be used, and we really need to be part of uh, of, of this process. Thank you. And I, I know we're almost coming to the end, but I'm going to try and squeeze in one more quick question. Um, so quick answers for, for the panel, if that's possible. Um, we've talked about the need for transdisciplinarity and these long term um, supported relationships, I suppose, with both local communities and then maybe uh, related project partners. Um, would you have any advice for how people could maybe um, sustain that? Um, um, throughout, you know, over a series of different maybe research projects or times when you might have or, or not have funding. Would anyone have any advice? John? Um, let me say, I'm, I'm, this is one of the things I'm really bad at. I mean, basically, it's it's about knowing people and keeping in touch with people. Uh, 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 I'm hopeless at social media. Um, social media makes sure that what you're doing is, is, uh, is available and and uh being interested in their work uh, at least as much as being interested in in the work that you would like to do with them and i think it's by cultivating those relationships um and maintaining them uh, it, it really is it's about building social capital with all the different sorts of stakeholders that uh, tally and uh, tiliana and ian have talked about that need to be important in this process and, and keeping in touch with them and yeah things do take quite a long time uh, and gradually you'll build up a, a, a collection of, uh, uh, of colleagues uh, and, uh, and if an interesting proposal comes up uh, you're much better able then to, to pitch for it because you've got the relationship set up um, uh, and you can put a proposal together but it is about people and this is about relationships lovely tally do you want to add something quickly Oh, Tally, we've lost your sound again. <laughs> Ian. Yeah, just to just to reiterate that, really. I mean, I completely agree with with John there. I think that your, your first project together, your first formal project together, gives you you know reporting deadlines, milestones, things like that, which which force you to um, to carry on conversations which you know if you just met at a conference and and uh, went your separate ways you might think oh their work is interesting that's what brings you together but but that's really a, a kind of a it should be or it could be if it goes well a permanent change and you know my my collaborators around the world are my friends and when something comes up i think of those and i say oh have you seen this so there might be a gap in us formally connecting but we keep an eye on each other's research and, and we consider each other friends. And I think that helps then when future stuff comes up. Lovely, thank you. 
Right, well, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time. I mean, it's a hugely important topic. I think it's close to all of the panel's hearts and mine, I'd say, as chair. Um, thank you. You've imparted a huge amount of really valuable knowledge today. So I hope, I hope the audience have found that uh, useful. Um, I'd just like to thank you all, the, the speakers, panellists and the audience, um, for all your participation. I think that's made it a really interesting event. Um, the slides and recordings will be distributed to all attendees. Um, and I hope if you've enjoyed this one, that you'll, you'll come to some of the next ones that, that, that are being organised. OK, thank you all ever so much. Um, it's been a really interesting session. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.